This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. Amen. Anyone remember being a teenager? Yeah? Yeah, anyone, anyone rather forget? <laughs> That's right. That's right. I remember being a teenager, and I remember going to see The Phantom of the Opera and uh, needing binoculars or uh, opera glasses to see the expressions of the people on stage. And I thought, you know, well, there are other people around here with these opera glasses, so to speak. And so I didn't feel weird about it. Uh, I felt like, well, these are the seats we got. and <laughs> Maybe it takes binoculars to see the stage from here. Thought it was normal. I remember driving to a concert in Los Angeles alone at night in traffic and almost out of gas. And I remember having to crane my neck. I'm here, here I am with the steering wheel having to crane my neck, getting right under the freeway signs to see where I was. You know, the, the white letters on the green background. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Crane of my neck, looking at these street signs, squinting to make out where I was before I ran out of gas in Watts. I'm 18 years old, 17, I'm 17 years old, and here I am. I didn't have any money on my person, and so how I was going to get this gas, I don't know. Uh, but I found out that I needed it while I was in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and I knew I had to pull off the freeway right now. And I did. Not only did I not have money for gas, I didn't have money for parking at the concert. Didn't realize that, you know, you needed such things, and it's expensive. Uh, so I was, I was all over the place. It, I'm, I'm sure it's clear to you as I'm telling this story, as it has become painfully clear to me, that I had a vision problem in more ways than one. I had a vision problem. I couldn't see properly. Physically, my eyes, mis ojos, could not see properly. And you would agree with me that I did not see the world or my place in it or planning or direction properly either. Amen? You can say amen. You're like, yeah, you did not have it together <laughs> at all. Bad vision. But look. That's okay because God sends people who can see to help you when you can't see. Amen. Eventually, my folks figured out something was wrong <laughs> and they took me to the optometrist and they got me some glasses. And uh, that was okay. That was okay with me because I looked amazing in them. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, but I, really, I could finally see all that I had been missing. It was there the whole time. Most everybody else seemed to be able to see it. But I had missed it. I had missed it. I was, I was lost in a sea without being able to see. I'm so thankful that even in my times of blindness, God came to give me some help. Aren't you thankful that God shows up to help you when you can't see something right? Amen. By the way, I did get, I did get gas that night. My dad had given me an Alka-Seltzer bottle full of quarters. And so I was able to put enough gas on my tank. And that was when gas was like a buck 20. And so I was, I was off to the races right there. And then there was a guy with a parking, uh, with, with a, an auto garage around the corner from the concert. And I said, I don't know what I've been doing. This is ridiculous, but I need to park and I don't have any money. Can I use your parking? I said, I'm late to the concert anyway. It's probably going to only be another 45 minutes to an hour. He's like, well, all right. And so he let me park for free. But the opening act hadn't gotten done by the time I had gotten there. So it was still like three hours before I got out of there. And I thought this thing was going to be closed. When I, you know, but I was like, I paid my money. <laughs> so anyway, here I am, 17. Vision problem. All right? But I should have been seeing those things on the stage too without the binoculars. And I've only now come to realize that. I didn't even know that I wasn't seeing... But people, regular people, normal people, if, if you're aligned right, you should be able to see all that. You don't need binoculars to see, like, to Mark or whatever, right? I should be able to see Mark well right here. He's just right there. <laughs> so you may be wondering, I haven't seen you in glasses, Pastor Jeff. What gives? Did you get some LASIK? 
You got some contact lenses? No. I don't know exactly how this happened or the genesis of this whole thing, but the Lord has healed my vision and I have way better vision than I did back then. And I don't know how it happened, but the Lord is good. Praise God. Praise God. Don't you love that God does crazy things? Miracles? I'm living proof in all kinds of ways, but I'll just tell you that one for today because we got a lot to get through. Now I see street signs, I see stages, I see seasons, and I see spiritual things more clearly than ever before. Amen. Because I allowed God to open my eyes. I allowed him to open my eyes. And that is what I invite you all to do today. Come to God ready to receive something new right here, right now today. In the wind and in the cold. Allow him to open your eyes. And God has sent me to help you do it. Aren't you thankful that God gives us help? This message is called open your eyes open your eyes and it's the climactic series ender of the plan the plan we've been in it for about seven weeks now and here we are this is the big one the fact that you're here today is going to put you ahead of those who are not here today to hear this specificity of the plan Unless God opens our eyes, we won't be able to see what he has planned for us. So, Lord, we invite you right now to open our eyes, just as you've done in many times and many ways in my life. Open our eyes. We want to see Jesus. In John 4, verse 35, if you have your Bibles, John 4, verse 35, Jesus says this, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest after four months? Behold, or see it this way, right? Open my eyes, see it this way. I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. He says, what you're looking at, how you're seeing, if your eyes are even closed to it, you're not going to see the opportunity that's all around you. But I'm telling you, look at it my way. Look at it my way, see they're already white. You're just not seeing. It's like Jesus is pleading with us. He's like, please, just open your eyes. Lift them up and look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing right here in your church at the Rock. Look at what I'm doing. Hear me. You see people, but you see them as not ready or not interested in God. Therefore, we aren't active in the harvest as we should be, and we can all acknowledge that. We have all acknowledged that, yes, I should be more active in the harvest. Lord, teach me how to do it. He's opening our eyes. Jesus is saying, look, fields are increasingly ripe for harvest. They're increasingly ripe for harvest, even around us. America is becoming increasingly ripe for harvest, and we must open our eyes. Open our eyes, or we will miss it. What did Ferris Bueller say? Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while, you can miss it. You can miss it. God needs to open our eyes to the ever-ripening harvest here in America. Because look, when we look at the news, what do we see? Dark, right? The news is bleak. Darkness, though, helps no one. If it bleeds, it leads. Look, darkness helps no one. Light is needed. People may like darkness for a while, like, you know, when they're sleeping, but any good parent is going to come around at some point in the morning and say, it's time and throw open the curtains. And it's like, I'm melting, melting. You know, the teenager might say, but look, it's appropriate for a parent to come to you like I'm doing right now and saying, open your eyes. God is doing something right here. He's intent to do something. And he's going to do it if we say yes. If we say yes. Because nothing happens by magic. We have to give, it's our agreement. Our agreement, I am willing, do it through me. All your promises are yes and amen. Through us. Through us. Open your eyes. When darkness increases, as we've been seeing in this oh, crazy, tense political climate and all the rest, when darkness increases, people begin to hunger again for light and for help. And God is our only help. He wants to open your eyes to that fact again today. And he wants to open your eyes to the increasingly ineffective approaches of the American church. Can I say it again? 
He wants to open our eyes to the increasingly ineffective approaches of the American church to combat the darkness that's all around us. Most churches, and we have been in this mode too, but we're exiting this mode. This is what I want to talk to you about. We're exiting a mode of ineffectiveness and we're entering a mode of biblical, modeled, sure effectiveness. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about, and I'm excited about it. You know I'm, I'm amped up about this. Jesus called us to make what? Did you say bigger churches? Did, did you say more multimedia events? Jesus called us to make social media accounts. Come on, what did you say? Jesus called us to make what? Disciples. And when we look around, the one thing that we can say that we have not made very well is disciples. Does that make anyone else a little panicky? It makes me a little panicky, which is why we're not committed to an old methodology that requires more and more and more dollars and charisma and people and finance and all the rest to accomplish. No, it, re it requires obedience, simple obedience to the Word of God, and He has given us everything we need to go through this life in godly ways and accomplish this great commission. Open your eyes. In Matthew 28, you all know it. You all know it. Someone was around me the other day quoting this verse. Matthew 28. Allie, I think it was you. I think you brought that right out there. Verse 19. Jesus says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. All nations. And I'll tell you what. Start with one. <laughs> start, <laughs> start with one. Love the one you're with. All right? No, that's, that, that's a different context. But in, the, in this way... Man, start with America. You live here, right? Let the Lord use you to make disciples here in America. Amen. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And here's how you're going to know how well you're doing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to what? Teaching them, see, I love it, to obey to obey what? Everything. <laughs> Everything. I've commanded you. And Jesus says this, when you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, starting with baptism, I will be with you every second of your life. Till the very, when I wrap this whole thing up and time no longer exists, I'm going to be with you. Jesus said, when you make disciples, I'll be with you. When you're about my business, I'll be with you. Not this idea of building bigger barns. You know, in the Bible, we read that parable and it's like, man, you fool, you're going to die tonight. Who's going to enjoy all your big barns now? You know? No, no, no. Freely you receive, freely give. And the Lord Jesus is showing us how to do it. In fact, it's always been here in the Bible. But we need to open our eyes to these clues that he's given us because the truth is, and this is, this is a weird thing to say, but the truth is the American church, churches all around us, they don't, they're not seeing it yet. I pray that they will see it increasingly. But God has clued us in in advance. He's tipped us off even before COVID-19 hit and everything went crazy and went haywire. He clued us into this thing and he was charting a new path for us. He's saying, this new path, it really looks like the old path I charted in the Bible, but why don't you get on that path? And so this is what we're moving into at The Rock and it's so riveting, so exciting because I'm not satisfied with what we've gotten up to this point. In all the churches I've been to, in the decades of ministry that I've been serving the Lord and trying, I, in my heart, I've been trying. You know that about me. I'm, I'm a trier. I'm earnest. Like what you see is what you get. You know, I, I, don't, I don't leave anything out or, or mislead or anything. I, I really want to be effective. I really want to serve. I want to help. And I've still missed it because the Lord had to open my eyes. And it's in this season I've seen it so clearly. 
I've had glimpses in the past and I didn't know how to fit the puzzle pieces together until now. The Lord has brought insight and revelation to me and I'm so thankful for it. I'm going to bring it to you. But Jesus said, when you're making disciples, I'll never leave you. When you're making disciples, I will never leave you. That's what you're supposed to be doing. I'm going to be with you, empowering you the whole step of the way. Every step of the way. Look, many people attend, but few people obey. I said many people attend, but few people obey. What, what did James say? Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Look, Jesus is not discouraged at the darkness that he sees all around us. He's not discouraged. He always knows what to do. He's like, I got this thing in the bag. Just come along with me. Come along with me. We'll get it. We'll win them. We'll disciple them. Amen. Just follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. Whatever you've been fishing for up to this point. If you've been fishing for Instagram followers, look, I'll make you fishers of men. I'll give you real success. And you'll know it because disciples will be following in your wake. Amen. Though American churches have largely focused on addition, how large we can grow our churches, churches in the book of Acts, in the Bible that we profess to say contains all the answers, right? Churches in the book of Acts rapidly multiplied. Someone say multiplication beats addition. So much faster. Come on. So, let's look at disciples. In Acts 6-7, the word of God spread and then the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, that was like home base. They multiply greatly in Hesperia, right? They multiply greatly right here at home. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. There were church leaders coming around to this thing. And I pray that over our desert. I pray that other church leaders who don't get it yet, they will start to understand it because we all want and need and love each other. And let's, let's get this thing together. Unity. The Lord commands blessing on it. Let's do that. Because we're not about bigger barns over here. We're about making disciples. Now, so hold that disciples thing in, in your front pocket. Now, let's think about churches. In Acts 9.31, so this is what? Three chapters later. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Wait, 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 wait. What? We had a multiplication of disciples happening right here, but where did all these churches come in all of a sudden? Look, that's multiplication. That's multiplication. The churches throughout all Judea, now bigger than Jerusalem, right? Or, or it's, it's apart from Jerusalem. Galilee, this is like concentric circles now. Galilee and Samaria or in central Israel. Like this, the, the north, you know, regions are coming into alignment. And churches are popping up. The whole nations see churches multiplying everywhere. Not just one church getting bigger and bigger, you notice. We're not going after big churches. We are not going after big churches. We're going after making disciples. It's like Pastor Jennifer, in even receiving the offering today, it's like spread out, scatter. There's one who scatters yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than is right and it leads to poverty. Multiply, reproduce. And look, look at what happened to all these churches. They had peace and they were edified. Would you like that? Sure, the churches were growing too and they had peace. Not struggle. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Hallelujah. I'm talking to the Bible. I'm speaking the Bible out to you. This is what it says. Churches kept multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. And mostly what we've seen around us for our decades of life and ministry is addition at best. Addition at best. And, and if we're honest, not much of that either. Not much of that either. And certainly not much multiplication. Look, we get distracted by mega churches and falsely see that as a, some successful model that we need to do. And then we aim to build bigger barns, but the parable tells us it's foolish. Gathering and not scattering. Collecting converts instead of making disciples. Uh, this is an, a, a bit of a non sequitur, but it, it might reach some of you in a different way. The business model of Amazon, it's not, it's not like the blockbuster video, right? Blockbuster video is like, we'll, we'll store the hits, right? 
All the big ones. And how many blockbusters do you see now? I think there's one, and they turned it into an Airbnb as a joke. I, anyway, so Amazon does this thing called the long tail. And so, yeah, they got the blockbusters, but they also have <laughs> everything else. And there's much food in the fallow ground of the poor. There is so many disciples waiting to be made if we just lift up our eyes and look. Don't say four more months. Don't say, oh, if we only grow this big, if we only had this. if We, we have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. We got the Holy Scriptures too. There is nothing we can't do. Especially when he says, go make disciples and I'll be with you. I'll never leave you for a second. If you go and make disciples, I'll be with you. Look, we do see big churches, of course. We all know we've seen some big churches. In Acts 4.4, 4, the Jerusalem church, it says, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now, if their families are anything like my family, that's a lot of thousands multiplied because there's some kids, you know. That could be 20, 30,000 people if it's like me. All right. Two chapters after Pentecost, they've already got 5,000 men in the church. Praise God. But look what we also see, small churches. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 says, The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord. With the church that is in their house. Thank you, John. Yes, right here. Local, cozy, family, multiplying and discipling. Amen. Why should the Holy Spirit, let me ask you this, why should the Holy Spirit waste any time any pages of our Bibles talking about small churches if they weren't important. If they were not critically important, he wouldn't waste his time. Look, just hit the big boys, right? We'll, we'll focus on, on the successful ones. No, 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 that's not what the Lord is saying. We see it that way, but we see it wrongly. The thousands of collected converts. No, the Holy Spirit keeps on mentioning and discussing small house churches with us in the Scriptures. It's for a reason. There's something to learn here. Much food in the fallow ground of the poor. Don't ignore small. Like Paul told Timothy, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth or because of your size, you know? Like, let's contextualize that. We can do great things. Everybody left Jesus. Do you remember that? Even the 12 left him that night that he was betrayed. But they came back. Those, and those 12 did it with Matthias, of course. You know, they did it. And that's why we're here today because they did it. They kept it going. There is no lack of ability because Jesus is with us when we go with him. The American church is experiencing a recession. I don't know if you can see it, but the trends have been steady and it's well documented. There's a book that, that has been informing a lot of this with the data and the facts from so many independent researchers called The Great Evangelical Recession by John S. Dickerson. Uh, if you want a horrifying read, <laughs> you can read that, especially the first six chapters, but it does get better. There is, there is a fix, and I've already told you about it, but let me, let me explain the bad news first. Number one, the American church is inflated. The number of evangelicals in America is inflated. We're not like the 80% that have been reported. Man, America is mostly Christian. That is not true. You know, you know what the actual numbers are? Can I devastate you for a minute, please? Let's just call it 7%. It's around 7% actually believe what we believe. Yikes. People who call themselves Christians or attend church or this or that, they don't hold to the principles of the Bible. Many may not even believe that Jesus is the only Savior. How do we get away from that? How, 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 how the mighty fall, you know? We are so biblically illiterate and all the rest in the American church. We, we need God to open our eyes, amen? Number two, we're hated. You know this. You've seen the increasing animosity around Christians and our beliefs and all that in recent days. There's a growing hatred in America toward us. It's increasing. There was a baptism at one of our campuses at the beach recently, and there was a group of protesters around there Yelling, screaming, throwing stuff at them while they're trying to baptize people in the, in the water. Now, praise God, they just kept going. But you know what? They're, we're hated. We don't enjoy some of that we thought we used to. That the church was maybe more revered and pastors were respected and all that. I, I think we've seen what the American church has been producing 
in terms of disciples and even pastors, right? Can I just say it? Honestly, have, have we seen some pastors take the big dive? Unfortunately, we have. Unfortunately, we have. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Number three, dividing. American churches increasingly are divided by worldviews and politics. It's like it's no better in the church than it is out there. We're just divided. So it's increasingly difficult for people in churches to even talk with one another and discuss. They just get annoyed with one another and depart instead of sticking together. Brother to brother. Sister, sister. Didn't know how much I missed you. Anyone remember that? All right. We were talking about Jack A the other day. Sorry, it just came out. Look, the, anyone seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix? That is it. And I've been reading about it for about a decade and a half, knowing that the Silicon Valley people who have brought forth these apps, they, they're really good at their jobs. They're doing a great job in terms of you know, what, what their bottom line is. More views, more time, more engagement, more scrolling. But also what, what we're discovering is that we have our own personalized news feed. So you're like, how can, how can you not agree with me? This is all I'm seeing on my news feed. And they're like, I haven't seen any of that. All I'm seeing is this contrary thing. You crazy. Well, I think you must be crazy. You know, like, that's what's happening because it's so customized, the algorithms, and we've gotten, man, too big for our britches, right? So, of course, we're dividing. Number four, we're bankrupt. Americans are giving less, and the most generous givers are aging out. The givers that have kept this church thing, the behemoth afloat, are aging out. And they're retiring and they're passing on into heaven. And the younger generations are not generous like that. <laughs> it gets real bad. I'm not going to tell you those statistics. I don't want you to cry. You know, it's cold enough. Your tears are going to freeze to your face. All right. The younger crowd is not giving with the same level of generosity. All charities, including churches, suffer from this. Because younger people are just less generous. Number five, we're bleeding. The American church is losing members and primarily the young. And I look around at all of our families here and I'm like, man, not on my watch. I, this is disgusting that two thirds of the people, of the young people who leave by the time they're 20, that they leave the church, two thirds never come back. It's awful. It's not right. As the years go on, the church that we've known and loved gets smaller and smaller and weaker and weaker. And number six, we're sputtering. The American church is running out of steam. We're less effective. We spend more and more money on less and less results. This cannot continue. Barna, a very well-respected research group, reports that COVID-19 has had such an adverse effect on churches in America that approximately 20% or one in five will close in the next 18 months. One in five churches will. Do you think we need more churches or less churches? More, yeah, that's exactly right, Chuck. Yeah, more churches, not less. It's easy to see the signs that this author has stated. I tell them to you and, and they're horrifying, but you're like, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, you're right, and it's sad. However, God has been speaking to us about his plan to shine in darkness. Isn't that true? He's been telling you, arise and shine. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord will be seen upon you in Isaiah 60. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Though we don't yet see this in America, the glory of God is shining brightly in other places of the world, right in the midst of deep darkness. So it's possible if we catch it, if we open our eyes. God, open our eyes. Who has seen Sheep Among Wolves, Volume 2? A few of us. Riveting. Riveting. About the fastest growing church in the world in Iran, where it is absolutely illegal to be a Christian or to give the gospel or to be a part of a Christian church, all of that. But... They have started so many underground churches that are multiplying and disciples are being made. They are thriving. The church in Iran is thriving. Why? Because they don't do it the way that we do it. We've made something. I like how Francis Chan, some people may not understand Francis Chan, but I love this man. 
And for me, he gets it right. He's like, if you only had the Bible, tell me how we got what we do in the American church. Just please. And he's right. We have, you know, it's like you make the word of God to no effect that your vain traditions. That's what I'm talking to you about today. Open your eyes. The Lord is going to do it. China, of course, like Iran, is having similar results. The underground church. People are just getting it done because they're making disciples. It's a video of our brothers and sisters thriving in the midst of darkness. I'm going to show you how Jesus is building his church like he said he would here in America and throughout all the world. Jesus' last words on earth were, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's called the Great Commission, and we think that if Jesus said it, that should be our goal. Now, imagine this is your assignment. You must reach a group of 8 million people who have never heard of Jesus before. To make it more realistic, it is illegal to work with this group. The dominant religion of the area will imprison or even kill people if they become followers of Jesus. The area is hard to get to, has extreme poverty, and is filled with warfare and violence. You might say, we'll reach some of them, as many as we can, you know, one person at a time. But that's not what Jesus asked us to do. He asked us to reach all of them. Seems impossible, right? But the Bible says within two years, every Jew and Greek in the province of Asia had heard about Jesus. How did they reach 15 million people? A few years ago, we began to really take notice of hints in the Bible. We talked to people around the world who had seen hundreds of thousands of people become believers. We discovered a biblical process which can be described as church planting movements, CPM for short, and this is how it works. We start by desperately asking God where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do. We've learned that God has already started working with people even before we get there. He creates a spiritual hunger in certain individuals. In Luke 10, they are called persons of peace. A first step is to walk through villages and neighborhoods, asking God to show us these people he's spiritually stirring. Just like Jesus' disciples in Luke 10, through conversations we share about God and pray for miracles. If they respond with interest, we suggest meeting with their family and friends where they can hear stories about God from the Bible. Just like the early disciples, we hope to meet with groups of people as a way of spreading the news of Jesus as far as possible through their social networks. We call these gatherings discovery groups. We read a Bible story, ask those present to retell the story in their own words, and then ask four questions. What does this story tell us about God? What does this story tell us about people? What does it tell us we ought to do? And who am I going to tell what I've learned? Teaching doesn't come from us. We just ask questions. The teaching comes from Scripture and the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing how much better the Holy Spirit is at teaching than we are. Within a few weeks, we step away and coach the group to continue learning from the Bible how to obey God, which allows us to meet more new people and try to start another group. Each week, the group reads a new Bible story and asks the same four questions. Amazingly, even before they would call themselves believers, they are beginning to obey God in their life because they're asking the question, what does this story tell us we ought to do? They begin to treat people differently, their wife, their husband, their friends, their enemies. They begin to live less selfishly, to help people in need, to stop using people, to live more honestly, 
and often their community begins to notice. Because they're naturally sharing with others what they're learning, their friends become intrigued and want to know more. Soon a new group forms because they've seen how simple it is to meet with a group and study what God has to say about life. Before long, these groups become home fellowships or churches. Disciples begin making disciples who make disciples. Churches begin making churches who make churches. And growth begins to happen exponentially, just like it occurred in the New Testament. Just like Paul in the early church, we check in on our friends from time to time to see how they're doing and to encourage them. If they have questions, we mostly refer them back to Scripture so they realize they don't need us, they need God. The question has been asked, is the faith of these people shallow? Actually, the exact opposite. When they're asked the question, what does this story tell us we ought to do, they are challenged to put what they've learned into practice. It's not theory to be learned, but a new life to be tried. It's obedience that keeps it from being shallow. Does this kind of rapid growth lead to heresy? Not usually, because the Holy Spirit is teaching rather than a dominant human leader. Everyone is answering with their own insights of what God is teaching them. They challenge answers that don't come from Scripture. It's a healthy group dynamic that leads to surprising maturity. Does it work? When groups of believers reproduce to at least four generations, then we consider this a movement of God, and it tends to be self-sustaining with momentum to continue. Amongst all of the organizations that use CPM principles, including our own, hundreds of movements are active worldwide, and they're present on every continent. In India, some movements have reached 14, 15, and even 30 generations, including one movement with 10 million baptized believers and at least 250,000 home churches. In China, there are 150,000 house churches in one movement alone. Many of these movements are happening in the hardest, most unimaginable places. God seems to be doing something new, or more accurately, something old. It's been around for more than 2,000 years, tracing back to a Savior and 12 improbable followers who changed the world. But we're now rediscovering and applying them, and the results are taking us beyond where we thought possible. Incredible, right? It's like, man, who, who knew? Jesus said, make disciples, and, and then people did it, and it worked. Ah, that's amazing. Anyone's heart like all of Twitter right now? I'm excited about this. How in the world is this happening? God has been speaking to The Rock for this, about this for a while. We need to become the Jew to the Jew, the Greek to the Greek, the American to the American, and contextualize this thing. However, we have intentionally not gotten out ahead of God and tried to do something. Like, I know how to do so many of these things that we do in the American church. I could make the coolest thing you've ever seen, but I've not seen it work. So I don't do it. It's a waste of time. We don't devote any of our resources to that anymore. Instead, we're focusing on making disciples. They have discovered some kingdom secrets to multiplication. And one of them is bigger does not always mean better. We love bigger. Our prosperous nation and all the rest. Richest country in the world. Leader of the free world and all the rest of it, right? Oh, America, 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 right? We love it. And we pride ourselves on it and everything. But you know what? We're not making disciples yet. We need to make some disciples. The research shows clearly that bigger is not always better by a long shot. And let me illustrate this to you with an example that I learned from some of these successful disciple makers. Now let's say that you're responsible for a village that has had a food source which has been feeding them for many years. But this food source is going to run out in three years. It's going to happen. You have the task of keeping this village from starvation and they're on the brink of it. What do you give them? Do you give them two adult elephants fully grown 
or do you give them two baby rabbits? Now, unless you grew up with rabbits, you might choose the elephants. Man, they're so much bigger. They got a lot of food on them. You know, they're huge. Now, I want to show you something, and I have to change the way my notes look so I can, I can walk this through with you. But let me tell you what happens with elephants. They're only fertile four times per year. But rabbits are practically continuously fertile. Elephants have only one baby per pregnancy. Rabbits, on average, have seven babies per pregnancy. A mother elephant carries a baby elephant for 22 months. Mamas, you're like, Lord, Lord. Rabbits, the mother carries a baby, the baby rabbits for one month. 22 to one month. The age that female elephants can have a baby is 18 years. They have to wait till they're 18 to have a baby. I like that. But look, rabbits, age females can have babies is four months. Woo! I know. I got some. <laughs> even through the sunglasses, I can see the eyebrows. You! Elephants, in three years, two elephants become three elephants. In three years, two rabbits become 50,643 rabbits. In three years, elephants can yield 26,000 pounds of food as such. In that same three years, rabbits can produce 661,000 pounds of food. In five years, two elephants become four elephants. And in five years, two rabbits become 69 million rabbits. Hello. In five years, elephants can yield 38,000 pounds of food. Say 38,000 pounds. In that same five years, rabbits can yield 925 million pounds of food. Are we seeing something? Is the Lord opening our eyes to something? We got elephants and we got rabbits. Right? <laughs> I hope I'm painting the picture for you because clearly America has tried the elephant, the elephant in the room. And we all have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. It's not taking us where we need to go. It's not taking us where Jesus told us to get to. Even though all the churches around us and even our, us ourselves, we ourselves have been in that mode no longer, no longer. I got to get to where I, I was on my notes near the end. Got to scroll. Let's apply this to churches. America has had elephant churches, big, expensive. They require buildings and insurance and staff, and they're just big, and they're slow to multiply if they ever multiply, right? If they ever multiply. In the past three decades, America has grown by 50 million people, but the church has not. The church has not grown. It's declined. So not only are we not keeping up with the growth, we're going backwards. Anyone can say we have a problem here? The church in America must wake up. What happens when you wake up? What do your eyes do? They open. That's right. Open your eyes. Darkness is accelerating and light is not catching up. How many of you can see the benefit of rabbit churches over elephant churches? Yes. Pretty clear, right? Can you see the benefit of rabbit churches over uh, elephant churches? Unlike elephant churches in America, rabbit churches can multiply very quickly. Elephant churches do serve great purposes. Number one, elephants are seed transporters. They eat an incredible amount of vegetation and then they release what is not necessary. And uh, the, they sow seeds of vegetation everywhere they go. Praise God. Ele uh, number two, elephant dung feeds insects and fertilizes plants. Another positive. Number three, elephants dig water holes and provide water for many animals. That's good. And number four, elephants clear pathways for smaller animals to walk. We aren't talking about the elimination of all elephant churches by any stretch. No, no, no. We're talking about the multiplication of rabbit churches that goes much, much, much farther than elephant churches can. We need elephant churches, but we need many more rabbit churches. 
Rabbit churches can move much more quickly than elephant churches. Rabbit churches can occupy spaces that an elephant churches cannot occupy. They can fit right in there, fit the need, find the need and fill it. Rabbit churches are much more cost effective. Rabbit churches can multiply very rapidly and exponentially and reach far more people. Rabbit churches can spread to and survive in new cities and regions and nations more easily. You know the elephants are only found on two continents on the, of the earth. Asia and Africa, that's right. With the exception of Antarctica, rabbits are everywhere else. All right? Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. Elephants are not getting it done. Not here. We can't rely on slow, bulky, hard to reproduce elephant churches anymore. We need as many rabbit churches as we can get so we can disciple as many as possible and multiply as often as possible. This is why God has called us to launch house churches. It's not that they're better for us. We like the old way. We've been coming to the old thing. We come and to campuses and the show and the big production and all the rest of it. That we like that. It's nice. But they're much more useful to God to reach a dying world. These rabbit churches. If the whole world's dying, would you rather have your comfort in some big building somewhere or would you rather have everyone else getting made into disciples and getting life everlasting and a destiny unlocked that they are going to reach and make disciples. That's what Jesus intended. How have we gotten so far off that? If you only had this Bible, how do you get what you get? Why are you doing what you're doing? I didn't, I didn't say that. Here's what Jesus does say in Mark 4, verses 30 to 32. He said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story could I use to illustrate it? It's like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shade. Notice Jesus describes that in the kingdom of God, things can appear very small and insignificant. What can that little thing do? That little baby thing, that little tiny old seed, right? Jesus, the, the little house church. What's that little house church going to produce? Jesus is like, ha <laughs> bet me. Bet me it can't produce. A little church can become over 250,000 churches, as we have seen, and baptize over 10 million believers. What, from one little house church? That's right. That's exactly right. From my own little house church? That's right. Why? Because now you're focusing on the gospel as stated. Jesus commission as stated, and not wasting a bunch of time and resources on everything that we've known up to this point. This is the kingdom of God. This is the power of the gospel. But we have to see it differently. We have to engage and invest ourselves in the thing that Jesus has said to do and not chase after something else. Who are we going to reach and how are we going to disciple them with the gospel? You know that in the rock and solid lives together, we've started over 150 house churches. Now, frankly... That's cool, but for our size, the thousands of people on multiple campuses, 150 is like, meh, right? I mean, if I'm being honest, and you know, you know me, I'm always honest with you. It's like, meh. We have the opportunity to do so much more, and this is where we all come in as part of the rock. We've just started this thing off. It's time to get it and kick it into high gear. There are some here who have waited to start a house church. You told me you've waited, now, but now is your time. Now is the time. Now is the time to start your house church. You're seeing the genius of God throughout this message and throughout the plan. You're seeing how smart God is, understatement of my life. And the actual instruction of God not to idolize the elephant church as we've done, the building, the come and see, look at me, attractional, seeker-sensitive model, of the American church. There's a premium right now on opening rabbit churches. Even when we see campuses open without any restrictions, people may come, get the gospel, but the idea is that they will go and d discover that, hey, I've been, I'm born to make disciples and plant churches. I'm born for, as a believer, 
This is what I was made for. This is what we've all been made for. They'll see how powerful it is to have a church right in that dark neighborhood where God's planted them, where light needs to spread. Amen? They'll see right where people need the gospel, that apartment complex, that gated community, that neighborhood, how delightful it really is to interact with your brothers and sisters in the family of God. The Word of God will transform people and communities if we'll only open our eyes and be obedient to what Jesus has said. And that's going to take a change. It's going to require us to do something differently. Few of us expected COVID to last this long. But I'm sure that God has called us in advance and we have started entertaining this and planning for this even before February. Those watching online who have not yet begun attending a church again, will you consider joining a house church? I hope you will. And those who are leading a house church, wherever you are, will you become a multiplying house church? Not just addition. Laura, Laura and I were talking about this this past week. It's not just about, oh, I got to get a bigger house to accommodate more people. That's elephant talk. We're talking rabbits here. And, and imagine, <laughs> just for a second, you, you're a house church, right? And you're like, but you know, we're going to grow to the size of a, an elephant. That's going to be a funky looking rabbit, right? Some big old rabbit. That would be awful, awful. Those of you who are attending a house church, Will you let God prepare you to start another house church? And not just collect so you look all good. You're going to look way better. And we know how to calculate this too. We know how to see it. Administratively, you're going to look better in every way by multiplying and not just merely adding. Here's something I learned from these movements. They teach every believer the Great Commission like this. Are you ready? Jesus has called you to be a disciple maker and a church planter. This is the Great Commission. Everybody makes disciples. And when you make a disciple, they need to go to church, right? Of course. Well, there aren't enough churches for every disciple, so you need to form a church. And that church will reach out, and another church will be formed, and so on. We haven't thought like this in the West. Not yet. We gather a bunch of people, face the front, and watch some devastatingly handsome pastor preach to you. Nothing. Crickets. All right. All right. Well, unless you think I'm right, then praise God. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We face the front and watch somebody like we're at the movies. Just kind of passive. And then we go home and remain passive the rest of the week. And then we come on back to what we like at church because it's so nice. In the body of Christ, from the head, he mobilizes us. Can you imagine every believer willing to obey the Great Commission? We've not seen it. We've not seen it yet. Asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me how to do this. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to do what you said. Show me how to do it. How to make disciples in obedience to your word. And even those maybe introverts or who would be intimidated by this concept, the Holy Spirit comes in and does a mighty work and may even outproduce those who have a boisterous personality and become the larger movement from someone who was timid at first. But the Holy Spirit's empowerment leaves nothing undone. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Everything that God's called you to do, you can do. You can do. This is thrilling. How many eyes here are being opened today? How many eyes are being opened? Amen. Amen. Four eyes, Don. I saw like this. <laughs> Don doesn't even wear glasses. I don't know how that's possible. He's getting it twice as good as everybody else. Praise God. I'm convinced that we all are going to see far, far more results in the coming years at The Rock than we have ever seen up to this point. I cannot, I cannot speak to other churches except that the greatest predictor of future behavior and, and results are past behavior and results. And that's what we've done. We're doing a new thing. Behold, God will do a new thing. Shall you not know it? God's saying you will see it when you do it. The body of Christ is not impotent. Jesus has always had this plan for us to follow him. He's written in the Bible. The Bible hasn't changed. Jesus hasn't changed. Father God hasn't changed. Holy Spirit hasn't changed. Somehow we just haven't seen it right. God's opening our eyes. He says, you make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them to obey me. And when you're doing what I've commanded you to do, I myself will never leave you, but you will be empowered for everything that I've called you to do. Helping you to succeed and live that abundant life. 
where you'll see so many people grateful to you for going to them and getting them saved and baptized and disciples, discipled. And your joy will be seeing them do the same for many, many others. Knowing that finally the kingdom of God is growing like it should. We don't need more elephants. Someone say, we don't need more elephants. We don't need more donkeys, by the way, as long as we're talking some politics right now. We don't need some elephants and donkeys up in here, right? All of you are all politically ah, up in a, a fervor. What we need is Jesus. And Jesus saying, you know, we need some rabbits. We need some, ra we need some two rabbits. They're going to multiply into some millions of rabbits, right? So in this political season, I just thought I'd throw that out there. We don't need to be focusing on donkeys and elephants. We need to be focusing on rabbits. Rabbits. Jesus said, when you choose more obedience, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will always be with you even to the end of the age. Amen. He's saying, we need more rabbits. Your political candidate is not the savior of the world, not the savior of America. Jesus is. And he's given us instructions and we can do it. He said, I'll tell you what the, the biggest commandment is, love. Love God best. Love your neighbor. And he says, you know how I gauge love? Obedience. Love, obedience. Love equals obedience equals love. LOL. <laughs> love, obedience. Let's take, a, like, let's take a moment to respond in obedience through prayer. I've intentionally not asked you to fill out your service card yet so we can do this very thing right now and then fill out your service card. Because these are the moments that we have to say, Lord, I see it. I don't even know where I've been this whole time, but now I see it. Thank you for opening my eyes and I'm willing to obey you. I am willing to obey you. You've spoken your word and it will change things. I'm willing to obey. Can we pray? Can we pray together right now? Father in heaven, thank you for speaking your truth to us. Your word is truth. Sanctify us by the truth, not by our habits, not by our preferences, not even by our potential or our opportunity. Lord, what we see in the old model of potential is nothing like we see in what you've always told us in the Bible. We're just seeing it now. Thank you for opening our eyes. Lord, we give ourselves to you. And we know that when we obey you, not only will you be assured that we love you, but you will be right with us, helping us to accomplish this thing. And we'll look back over our lives because of our obedience and we'll say, thank you, God, for calling me to this high calling, for not leaving me stuck in a dying church mode, but for calling me into this. And Lord, may this spread and may other churches even make the switch because of the rapid expansion and multiplication of your church here in America, right around us, starting from this epicenter of Hesperia. Because we've heard your word today. We decide to follow you. You make us become fishers of men. You've told us to make disciples and you'll be with us always. We're going to do it. Help us do it. We know it is you who work in us both to will and to do for your good pleasure. Holy Spirit, work in everyone who hears my voice right now. Everyone who wants to hear you, Lord, work in them. If there are any ears who have been intentionally stopped up, I pray that you would open those ears right now, open those eyes, and let them come around to the truth of what you're speaking. May your word take root in our hearts, and may your word get out of our mouths, and may many be drawn to you, the brightness of our rising and your shining upon us. In the name of Almighty Jesus, Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I'm thrilled. I'm excited. And I thank you for being on the journey with us. I will take you there. <laughs> We're going to get there. And it's going to be phenomenal. You've never seen anything like this. Nothing else comes close.